Hi, everyone. For this lecture, we're going to be going over the physiology of our blood vessels and um, how that contributes to blood pressure. We'll also look at how our blood vessels contribute to the flow of blood around the body and how we can adjust, make adjustments to that flow of blood to different organs. Okay. We'll also uh, look at the intrinsic and extrinsic properties that can help adjust that blood flow. And then we'll follow up with some uh, properties of our veins, as well as uh, the um, certain diseases that we might see associated with the blood vessels of our cardiovascular system. Okay, if I can get going. Uh, first, I, I put these pictures in here. This is from Body Worlds. So these are great pictures to show you what the system actually looks like. You know, we, we usually look at drawings of blood vessels as tubes and they branch into smaller areas. And that is what you see here. Here you can see the aorta coming down the center of the body, the carotid arteries going up toward the head. But then you see the branching, the subclavian, which will then branch if we had our arm here down into the brachial artery. Um, at, but what happens at the ends of the smallest arteries, they branch into the capillary beds and that's the site where exchange takes place. So most of the stuff that you see, you can see the capillary beds that infuse into our organs, um, into our skin, um, into you can see around our brain and such in order to supply those organs with the necessary nutrients and gases that it needs and then also to carry away the waste products. So I think this is a, in some ways a much better representation, um, but when we need to talk about individuals, arteries and veins, it's easier to see the drawings that we look at. So if you're having a hard time grasping a concept of what a capillary bed looks like, you know, come back to these types of pictures and uh, so you can see how the capillaries are so tiny and they infuse into the organs themselves. Okay. When we look at the distribution of blood, our blood, remember that we learned uh, last week that the heart is what supplies the pressure to propel the blood all throughout our body. And then it's the blood vessels where the blood is contained inside of there that distribute that to the different organs. Okay, and remember we, are, we have what's called a closed system. So all of our blood vessels are connected to one another. You might recall that from anatomy, you probably had to trace a, a blood cell from one area of the body to another by naming the different arteries that it travels through and then through the capillary bed and then the different veins that it travels through back to the heart. Okay, and so what this picture we can see here shows uh, just a simple view of the blood vessels bringing blood to different organs. And notice that blood flow to the different organs is not equally distributed, okay? Um, and so that's because different organs uh, that we have in the list here are different organs that uh, kind of recondition the blood. So remember that our blood contains the nutrients, oxygen, things like that, that all our tissues need. And as the blood flows by those organs, it releases those substances to those organs. So that implies that the blood needs to be reconditioned. It needs to gain uh, nutrients and, and oxygen and minerals and things like that again. And so notice that, of course, we get our nutrition from the digestive system. So the blood will come from the left side of the heart through the systemic system. And 21% of all the blood coming out of the heart will be diverted to the digestive system. Again, that therefore it can pick up the needed nutrients that the rest of the body needs. Um, the liver will uh, get some of those nutrients ready for us. And so we have a blood supply heading to the liver as well. The kidneys are very important because the kidneys will deal with much of the waste products, especially the nitrogenous waste. It also helps us to balance our salt levels um, and we'll learn more about what that does. So that receives a, a good amount as well, 20% of blood because we have to conti continually clean out the blood. Okay, and you can kind of go down the list and see the different uh, uh, quantities of blood as it gets distributed, okay? So this is the way that we um, can, our, our body system can maintain 
homeostasis because when we redistribute blood in the in these different quantities, it keeps the blood composition relatively constant. Okay. Um, some of these other organs, we can adjust the, the blood flow to these other organs as needed. So uh, usually in a, um, a regular situation at rest, the skeletal muscle gets about 15% of the blood flow. But remember, if you're in a sympathetic condition, we can then adjust the amount of blood flow, increase the amount to the skeletal muscle okay, when, when more is needed. So one thing to remember, if we can do that, when we control blood flow to one organ as opposed to another organ, um, we don't cut off the blood supply completely to another organ. Again, this is, this is what is pretty much ma maintained what you see here, this distribution. Because blood supply is not really, um, arteries don't supply blood in a downstream manner. Um, so therefore, again, if we're restricting blood flow to one organ, it doesn't mean it ends up restricting blood flow to another organ. So it's a really nice system. And here you can see at the bottom here, the brain can least tolerate disrupted supply. So at any one time, whether you're in a sympathetic uh, situation or not, the body is going to maintain this blood flow to the brain about 13%. Okay, it's really important that uh, we keep that uh, level. Okay, so I want you to come back and think about this as we move forward and we look at blood flow and then we look at how we can adjust blood flow to these different organs. Okay, um, uh, because this, this idea will come back into play here. Okay, so um, blood flow is, um, when we look at blood flow, it's the amount of blood, right, that is flowing through our arteries or veins at any one time. Okay, so we refer to that as the flow rate. Okay, the flow rate. That is, again, the volume of blood passing through a vessel per unit of time. Okay, and so that can be, uh, usually we um, uh, look at it per minute or so. Okay, so again, the flow rate can be adjusted. Okay, and it can be adjusted, it always is dependent on two major things. One is the pressure gradient, okay? Pressure gradient means there's a pressure uh, being placed on the blood flow at one end of a tube and there's less pressure at the end other end of the tube. And this is a property of liquids. Liquids always move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. This is a property in our plumbing system with our hoses, with everything like that. And, and it holds through with our blood system, okay? Um, it's also inversely proportional to vascular resistance. That means that the resistance that our blood vessels place on the blood flow, it's kind of like the back uh, inhibiting blood flow from occurring, that's resistance. Okay, so we said it's directly proportional to pressure gradient, and that's what you see here. So we use F is uh, equal to delta P, so that's the change in uh, pressure from one end of the tube to the other end. And so um, that is what we refer to as the pressure gradient. So since those two are both in the numerator, that means they're directly proportional. So that's telling you already that when the pressure gradient is higher, the blood flow is higher. If the pressure gradient is lower, then the blood flow is lower. Okay. It's going to be inversely proportional to resistance. Again, resistance impedes flow. Okay. So if it's inversely proportional, that means when resistance, when this number down here gets larger, that this number for flow gets smaller. Okay. So when resistance is greater, flow is less. Okay, and we're going to put some uh, numbers on that so you can see this a little bit easier. So again, the pressure blood flow depends on one of the great things is pressure gradient. Okay, and that's what you see in this picture. Here's a better picture of seeing that. So again, if there's higher pressure at this end and lower pressure at this end, then fluid is going to flow in there. If the pressures are equal, the fluid will just remain stagnant. It won't move inside of this tube, okay? Here's another way of looking at resistance. 
resistance, again, the measure of the opposition of blood flow through a vessel, through a tube. And resistance depends on three things mainly, how thick the fluid is, that's viscosity, okay? how long your tube is, that's vessel length, and then also the radius, how wide your tube is. Okay, If it's wider, more flow will be able to go through. If it's skinnier, less will be able to go through. So that's because it's producing more resistance. And again, we're gonna look at these things much more closely. So one thing I need you to remember, and maybe you wanna write this down, when we're talking about blood flow, we're talking about an amount of blood moving through a tube per unit time. Okay, so blood flow is volume per unit time. So it's the amount that's flowing through. I'm not talking about speed. Speed is velocity, right? And velocity is distance per unit time, okay? Distance per unit time. Sometimes, you know, when you're studying all this, there's a lot to keep track of. So one of the things I try to do if I get lost in my definitions and start to get confused, um, and I start to confuse blood flow with velocity. Just remember that velocity, most of us drive a car or you have experience in a car. We know we travel by miles per hour, right? So that's distance per unit time, miles per hour. But we don't measure blood flow that way. We're gonna measure it by volume per unit time. All righty. So again, let's look at blood flow first. We can see uh, here are several tubes that are showing different pressure gradients, right? So at one end of the vessel, if I have, uh, and other thing to notice at this point is that all the tubes are equal length, equal diameter, okay? But what is changing is the pressure gradient. So if at this end, the pressure is high at 50, 50 millimeters per mercury, and this side is only 10 millimeters of mercury, then the change in pressure is you just subtract the 10 from the 50. So the change in pressure or the pressure gradient is 40. Okay, if you need to help see that, let me, let me see if I can stop share here and I can share this. Okay, so again, you have a tube, here it comes. And if the pressure gradient at one side is 50 millimeters of mercury, all of my pressure gradients are gonna be in millimeters of mercury. So I'm not going to keep writing that, okay? Just for, to make this easier. If on this side, it's 10 millimeters of mercury, again, to figure out the change in pressure, I just, take the high pressure and subtract the low pressure. So my change in pressure here is 40, all right? But what if that's different now? What if this is 90? The, we raise the pressure on this end, okay? And um, the pressure over here stays at 10. So in this tube, the change in pressure is 90 minus 10, oops, right? And that is uh, 80. Right, so the flow rate in this one is 40, the flow rate in this one is 80, okay? So that means there is a higher volume of fluid passing through this tube than there is in this tube, okay? You can do a lot to manipulate. What if we had a tube, I'm gonna leave this one up there. What if we had a tube that had really high pressure, okay? It had 150 over here. And over here on this side was 145, right? So clearly the second tube here has bit much higher pressure than the first tube. But what about the flow rate? Again, the flow rate depends on the change in pressure. So the flow rate for this one is 150 minus 145, that's five, okay? So the, what this is telling us is that even though this tube is under much higher pressure, very, very high pressure, the rate is actually slower than this one. 
because the change in pressure, there's a steeper gradient. This has a much steeper, this has a steeper pressure gradient. than this one does. This one is less steep, okay? So again, it still has a higher pressure, but the gradient isn't nearly the same. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint. There we go. All righty, so uh, that's what these things are, are showing you as well, okay? It's just showing you that not only, it's not just how much pressure there is, it's about the gradient, okay? So on this one had a much higher uh, gradient than this one, so there's more flow, okay? And this one, the pressures are equal, even though this lower one has a much higher pressure overall, the gradients are equal, so the flow rate is gonna be the same. The rate that blood flows through those vessels are going to be the same. All right. There we go. So one way to think about this, let's apply. So these little tubes are supposed to represent blood vessels. So again, um, you have to really kind of envision what's happening with the circulation of our body. So this is just showing you a very shortened version of our systemic uh, system, the aorta branching off the left side of the heart and uh, going to our capillary beds, this can be the sum total of all our capillary beds, and then coming back to our venous system to the right side of the heart. And then here you have our separate pulmonary circuit from the right side of the heart to the lungs and back, okay? Um, when, we, when we look at this, we know that there's a pressure inside of the or aorta, okay? And so the aorta, aorta is receiving the stroke volume coming directly from the left ventricle. So it's receiving the highest amount of pressure. And so the mean arterial pressure is about 93 millimeters of mercury right at the aorta. Okay. Oop. Click this, click. There it goes. Now we're at the superior vena cava. Okay. And the blood that's being returned to the superior vena cava, and actually I could put the inferior vena cava here, um, is about as much lower. It's about five millimeters of mercury. It's about five millimeters of mercury. And so therefore, uh, the reason why it's five millimeters of mercury, again, the force of the heart for the systemic circulation is coming from the left ventricle. Okay, and your aorta is directly connected to that left ventricle. As the blood circulates around all of our blood vessels, and remember, we're not showing it here, but these branch into smaller and smaller arteries, they lose pressure as you, the further away you get from the heart. Okay, and by the time our blood flows through our capillaries and then merges back into our venules and our veins, it's lost a lot of pressure over that long period, okay? And the veins on this side that are connecting to the right side of the heart, if you could stretch our blood vessels out in series, just stretch it out from the aorta all the way down and just keep it stretching out. By the time you got to the veins, they would be so far away from the heart that again, that contraction of the heart uh, provides very little force when you get over to the venules, vein side, okay? And we see that in this lower pressure here at five millimeters of mercury. But what that means is that blood always travels from the area of high pressure to low pressure. So this is why blood circulates from the left side of the heart back to the right side of the heart. And that's because of the pressure that is being produced by the heart setting up a high pressure gradient, high on the left side and it's low on the right side. So again, the effects of the contraction of the left side of the heart is, is very insignificant by the time you get over to the superior and inferior vena cava. Okay. 
the pressure being applied by the right ventricle is being applied into the pulmonary circuit because of the connection with the pulmonary arteries. Okay, um, so, so the pumping action of the right side of the heart doesn't, doesn't really affect, we'll talk a little bit later, but it doesn't uh, put a big contribution on the pressure on the right side of the heart on the vena cava. Okay, that drives the blood through the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary circuit is under much less pressure, but it is higher at the pulmonary artery and lower at the pulmonary veins. So you get that circulation going as well. All right, so that's blood flow. What about resistance? And what I just was talking about gave you a little insight into resistance, but let's look at this. So again, Resistance is a measure of the opposition of the blood flow through a vessel. So what's, what's preventing that blood flow from moving forward? Okay, and that's dependent on three things. So here are the three things. One is blood viscosity. So how thick the blood is. And in normal situations, in a day-to-day -day situation, your blood viscosity doesn't really change very much. And so this is pretty negligible as far as our blood circulation goes. So we're not gonna to talk too much about that. If you're in a disease state, you, your blood viscosity can change. Okay, but we're gonna look at normal conditions here. So think of blood viscosity again as how thick a fluid is. So honey is very viscous and you know that flows much more slowly than if you pour it in water, okay? Vessel length is another one. So the length of a vessel, how far a fluid has to travel through a vessel can also impede resistance because as blood is flowing or any fluid is flowing through a tube, some of it is hitting the surface of the tube, the inner surface, right? And so as it's hitting the inner surface of the tube, the longer it flows, the longer the tube, so the longer distance it has to flow through the tube, the more surface that it's hitting, okay? But again, in a normal situation, looking at resistance in our cardiovascular system, our vessel length doesn't really change too much. So we're not too worried about vessel length regarding um, uh, blood flow. It did help us understand this concept that the reason that we lose pressure from the aorta to the uh, superior and inferior vena cava is partly, it's due to this length. Blood is traveling through, I mentioned, if you could lay the blood vessels um, uh, all out end to end in just a straight line, this would be very, very long. And so uh, because the blood is traveling through that length, it's losing pressure along the way due to the resistance, that's frictional resistance that it's hitting on the walls of the, of the blood vessels as it's traveling through. Okay, so that's true there, but causing a change in blood flow on a day-to-day -day basis, vessel length doesn't really change, okay? What does change is the vessel radius, right? So we've already talked about the aorta is our largest artery, then that branches into smaller arteries, which branch into smaller arteries, and those branches, every time they branch, you have to imagine smaller and smaller arteries, meaning the um, diameter or so the diameter is the total length across a tube, right? Or the sometimes we just deal with radius and that's half the length. That's from the center of the lumen or the tube to the outer edge, right? So radius is a smaller number that we like to deal with, okay? Um, that changes. So our largest arteries have the largest diameter and then they branch into smaller and smaller arteries, meaning that they have smaller and smaller diameters as you go to the capillaries who have the smallest diameters. They're microscopic in most cases. So the vessel radius or diameter is very important to us. Okay, it can really, this is what's causing uh, what we might call frictional resistance. Okay, so frictional resistance. So again, if we're looking at a tube here and we're seeing a certain amount of blood in there, as that this portion of blood is traveling through this tube, you can see with this radius, there's only a certain portion of the blood that's touching the walls. 
okay, that frictional resistance. Okay, if we made this smaller, this tube was smaller, imagine that squishes down, this would spread out. So there would be less blood in the volume because there'd be a smaller volume, but more blood touching the walls of this, um, of this tube. And so therefore that increases resistance, okay? And that increases, or I'm sorry, that increases the friction and that increases the um, uh, uh, resistance that it's feeling. Let's put some numbers on it. Okay, because what we know now too is that if there's just a slight change in the radius, it's gonna produce a significant change in the blood flow, okay? So one thing to, that we look at, if we're gonna throw some numbers on this um, so we can understand it better, is that remember is that one thing, well, let's go back here first. One more. Come on. I don't know why my, my um, there we go. Oh, one more. There we go. So we said flow was inversely proportional to resistance. Okay, so that we can, if we just called this one, we could say that F is equal to one over R. Okay, let's go back. That's why I couldn't go before. But R resistance is proportional to one over R to the fourth. Okay, one over R to the fourth. So that, that's just the information we need to know. Okay, so if we look at these two vessels, we're looking at two vessels here, the radius of vessel number one, let's just call it one centimeter. The radius of vessel number two, let's call that two centimeters. Okay, so that means vessel two is twice as wide as vessel one. Okay, um, I think from here, let's go back to, to our whiteboard. So I can screen share over here. There we go. So that we can put, so again, let's remind ourselves that vessel one is one centimeter. Vessel two is two centimeters wide, right? So we could do something like this. That's one centimeter wide. We'll say it's the radius. I kind of drew the diameter there, right? Here's the radius. This is two centimeters, okay? Um, so again, this is two times as wide as vessel number one, okay? But so what's gonna happen to flow? So, What's the difference in flow between these two? Okay, so again, remember that we just saw that resistance is equal to one over the radius to the fourth. Okay, well, the first vessel number one, that's easy. That's one over one to the fourth is one. Okay, so one over one is one. All righty, so the, here the resistance for vessel one is one. All right, but now if we look at vessel two, okay, one over r to the fourth, this is one over two to the fourth, which is one over 16. Okay, one over 16. So our excuse me, our, um, remember though that resistance or flow was change in P over R. So let's just make this easy on us. And instead of writing change in P, we'll make that a one. 
because that's really what it is. Flow is, is the inverse relationship of R. Okay, but R now we know is one over 16. So again, if you remember how to do your mat, your fractions, this is like saying one over one over 16. Okay, well, we can multiply the not denominator and the numerator, numerator by 16. That crosses that out, this becomes one. So our flow over here becomes 16, whereas here we said, one over one become as our flow that equals one so i know this became a mess so flow rate on vessel one is one flow rate on vessel two is 16. so even though vessel one or is half the diameter of vessel two vessel two flow rate is 16 times the flow rate of vessel number one. That's pretty incredible. So let me screen share back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so again, what that means is that what it says right here, we just saw by numbers that a slight change in radius, just a slight change, just by doubling it, we actually increase the flow rate by 16 times that of the first vessel. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you to do the math problems on that. I use numbers to just help illustrate that point. What I do want you to understand, you need to know what does it mean if something's proportional and then to remember that flow um, flow is proportional to uh, pressure gradient. So the higher the pressure gradient, the slower the flow. I'm sorry, the higher the pressure gradient, the faster the flow. Sorry, my dog is barking. He uh, distracted me. Okay, but the higher the resistance, the slower the flow. And then this point here about just changing the diameter. So resistance is mainly caused by vessel radiance. And by changing that radius even slightly, we can greatly change the flow. Okay, so this is going to come in because we're going to see this is what we do with our blood vessels. We vasodilate and we vasoconstrict them. Constricting, we decrease the radius. Dilating, we increase the radius. And it's going to have major effects on our flow. I'm going to mute myself. Okay, he went outside. Sorry about that. <laughs> Little technical difficulties. I may have to go back to the wine cellar uh, in order to uh, to continue to do our our recordings. Anyway, so so now and so here again. Now you can kind of see our vascular tree. So again, in the largest blood vessels, okay, the diameter is greatest, so blood flow is going to be greatest. So we already saw because the pressure at the arteries is higher because of the influence of the left side of the heart. So that's pressure gradient. It gets lower. The pressure is lower the further away from the left side of the heart you get. So that's pressure gradient. Also, there's less resistance in our largest arteries because the, the uh, radius is larger. Okay, so with the larger radius, there's less resistance. So we have more flow from that point of view too. As we get into smaller and smaller arteries, okay, there's going to be more resistance. Okay, and then we're going to see that we can manipulate some of these blood vessels to either create more resistance or less resistance. All right, so let's continue on with our arteries. There we go. 
So again, arteries serve as rapid transit passageways for blood. These are the largest diameter blood vessels closest to the left side of the heart. So be, again, because of that big, uh, large uh, radius, there's little resistance, okay? Now, they also get the strongest effects from the heart. As that heart is contracting, that means blood is just, bam, it's just hitting on the walls of the artery, okay? So I'm not gonna have you guys um, um, give back to me all the structure of the arteries that you learned in anatomy. Okay, so remember you had the endothelial layer, the tunica media, um, and the tunica uh, externa, the tunica intima. I don't want you to, I'm not gonna ask you to relay those back to me in physiology, but you do need to understand the structure in order to understand the function. So one of the things I do want you to remember is that our large arteries have a lot of collagen fibers. Okay, so more collagen fibers um, gives it strength because again, they're the closest to the heart. They're experiencing the contraction of the heart, all that stroke volume. So even though they're wide, there's still a lot of the pressure. Okay, so they have to be strong. So they have more collagen fibers at our largest arteries than as we get into the smaller ones and into our veins. There are also more elastin fibers. That gives elasticity to the cell walls, or I'm sorry, to the arterial walls, no cell walls here, to the arterial walls. Because what they can do is as they receive that pressure, they can expand as well. And that's what we see here. So here is, and uh, you can imagine this is our aorta. So there's stroke volume coming out. And every time that pushes blood, out into the aorta, which would normally, in this dotted line, that would be their diameter. Well, the pressure that from that fluid hits the walls, and imagine this is 3D, it's coming out at you, it's coming away from you too, and it causes our arteries to balloon out, okay? So we call them a pressure reservoir because this is that when it does that, when the elastin fibers stretch, they're storing the pressure. Okay, so it's storing the reservoir. So this happens during systolic pressure. The heart contracts, bam, it's pushing uh, a stroke volume, amount of blood out. It's hitting the walls of the arteries and the arteries are expanding. They're ballooning outward and they're storing that pressure. Okay, when we're in diastole, right? Diastolic pressure is when the ventricles relax. Okay, and the ventricles aren't producing any pressure, yet our diastolic pressure is somewhat high. It's still 80 millimeters of mercury on average. So that's still kind of high, but the pressure isn't being produced by the heart. It's the recoil of the arteries. So where the elastic fibers stored that pressure, now when the pressure of the heart is gone, the elastic fibers can recoil. And now that pressure gets applied back to the blood and remember, we have a valve here, so the blood can't go back into the heart. It gets propelled forward to the next segment of arteries and arterials and then to our capillaries, okay? So the property of collagen, the structure there, gives it its strength so we don't burst a hole through this. It's got a lot of pressure it's experiencing. But the properties, the structure of the elastin is providing the continuous propulsion of blood forward, even when we don't aren't experiencing any pressure from the heart during diastole. That's the recoil. Okay, so that's why we call it a pressure reservoir. Right? And we can measure that pressure. Okay, so uh, we measure pressure using a device called the Sigma manometer. If you're in lab, we did some of this already. Um, and um, basically we're looking at Korolkov's uh, sounds. I can never say that correctly, but these are the sounds that actually are heard uh, coursing through the uh, brachial artery. Um, and what you do, you take a blood pressure cuff and you wrap it around the arm 
so that it fits snugly over the upper arm where the brachial artery is inside. And when you pump up the break, the cuff uh, with a certain amount of pressure, what that does is it compresses the tissues underneath and it compresses and seals off the brachial artery. No blood flows through the vessel at that point. And if you put a, um, a stethoscope lower down and listen, you don't hear any sound because there's no blood flowing below where the cuff is. Okay, then you slowly start to release the pressure. And as you slowly start to release the pressure, um, you'll start the blood flow going through the area of the cuff where it's released, releasing a pressure on the brachial artery. The blood flow will be turbulent. And that turbulence, that's blood hitting the walls of the artery. So the first sound that you hear is your systolic pressure. So that turbulence usually starts at about 120 millimeters of mercury. That's normal anyway, or 115, okay? If you hear it at a higher pressure, then you have a higher systolic. If you hear it at a lower pressure, then you have a lower systolic, right? So then you'll kind of hear these intermittent sounds as the turbulence um, spurts kind of uh, equalize out. So then as the cuff st is still losing pressure even more, then the blood flow becomes real smooth. So the last sound that you hear, you gotta look at the cuff and you record the pressure at that last sound that you hear. And again, it's usually around 80, um, but it can, it can be different for different people and at different uh, um, activity level as well. Okay, so that's how the blood pressure cuff works. So you're actually listening to the blood hit the wall of the artery, okay? That leads us to something called pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is a, um, a measurement we can take because pulse pressure is proportional to stroke volume, right? So it gives us an idea of what our stroke volume is. It's also inversely proportional to the compliance of your aorta, right? So let me go back here, right? So this is the stroke volume. So when we measure pulse pressure, again, it's directly proportional to the stroke volume or how much blood is being pushed out of your left side of your heart. But it's inversely proportional to this compliance, okay? Um, and so that's going to tell you the compliance is how much it stretches. So real healthy arteries are able to stretch pretty wide. That means they have good elastic fibers. Think of it like a nice stretchy rubber band. Okay. Um, uh, if it's, if it's, um, if you're not able to stretch out your arteries, then we know we have a problem. So first let's see, how do we figure out pulse pressure? It's just the difference between your systolic and your diastolic pressure, right? So if you have a blood pressure of 120 over 80, you just subtract 80 from 120 and you get 40. And 40 is considered a normal and a healthy uh, pulse pressure, okay? Um, um, so again, the aorta has the highest compliance in the arterial system that's due in part to the greater proportion of the elastin fibers, right? So it's, it's kind of dampening that pulsatile output of the left ventricle and that's what's inducing the pulse pressure, right? So again, that stroke volume is producing the pulse pressure and the elasticity, okay? So as I mentioned though, if the elasticity is not there, your aorta becomes rigid. How does that happen? Like an arterial sclerosis would be a problem. So, so we said that pulse pressure was inversely related to the elasticity. So if there's no elasticity, if elasticity is low, pulse pressure would be very high. So if you do a, a reading, so again, how do you change pulse pressure? It's a difference between the systolic and diastolic reading, right? So if that becomes very wide, maybe you got a higher systolic and, and diastolic didn't change, then you're gonna see a change in the pulse pressure. And so again, doctors might then suspect um, there might be something wrong with uh, your arteries, such as arterial sclerosis, okay? If you're experiencing some kind of trauma and there's a low 
pulse pressure under 40 or even a narrow pulse pressure or well that's the same thing if it's low under 40 we also might call that narrow because that means your systolic and your diastolic numbers are more even they're closer to one another that would make a smaller number right so let's say that's 100 120 over 100 difference in 20 now so that's we call that both low and we call that narrow okay because there's a, a smaller number between the two right so um that might indicate that there's significant blood loss so if you have a trauma victim somebody who's been in a car accident and there's no obvious signs of bleeding you might take a quick pulse pressure and then uh, if it's very low you might uh, suspect there's some internal uh, bleeding right um, so we're talking like 25 millimeters of mercury or less um, that may be caused by a low stroke volume so maybe that's because of congestive heart failure or some kind of shock or something like that. Okay, so, um, so there's a lot of information we can get just based on pulse pressure in the short term. Okay, when we want to look a little bit more longer term, then we might look at mean arterial pressure. Okay, mean arterial pressure. So this is a function of cardiac output and resistance to the arterioles. That sounds similar to pulse pressure, but remember pulse pressure was stroke volume. So stroke volume is every time the, um, the heart contracts, right? And that produces a stroke volume. Stroke volume though, is the amount of blood produced by the stroke volume over the course of a minute. That's, or I'm sorry, cardiac output is the amount of stroke volume over the course of a minute, right? And so we, we multiply that by heart rate. So cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume, right? So mean arterial pressure, it's an average of our diastolic, systolic and diastolic pressures, but again, it isn't a simple average, okay? And what this does, mean arterial pressure then, it gives us an idea of what we would call the perfusion pressure at the organs. So the pressure that's actually um, occurring at the capillaries, perfusion then is the amount of substances that can cross the capillaries and feed our organs, right? That pressure has to be high enough to get to our organs, especially those organs furthest away, okay? So mean arterial pressure is a very important um, aspect. So again, I mentioned the function of cardiac output, but also then a function of the resistance of at the arterioles, the smallest arteries before we get to those capillaries. Okay, so let, let's look at how we figure out um, mean arterial pressure. So this is a function of, um, again, our diastolic pressure and our systolic pressure. So there's a couple ways that you can get mean arterial pressure, and it just depends on what how, what kind of math you want to do. I, I remember this one at the bottom and you should remember how to do mean arterial pressure. So I remember that it's not a simple average. So if we took an average of something, you would take however many values you have, add them all up and then divide by the number of those values. So uh, that would make mean, we have two values for pressure here, 120 over 80. So if you added 120 and 80, to get the average, you would divide by two, right? But here for mean arterial pressure, this is not a simple average, which is the math that I just did, because it's also about um, the effects of the systolic and diastolic pressures. So systolic, we are in systole for a much shorter time than we are in diastole. So the heart is at rest twice as long as the heart is contracting, okay? So that means we're in di diastolic pressure twice as long as we are in systolic pressure. So we need to add three numbers together. We need to add the diastolic pressure twice because we're in it twice as long and then add the systolic pressure. So because now divide by three, okay? So if your pressure was 120 over 80, then you would take 80 plus 80 or 80 times two, that's 160 plus 120, right? So that's 280. 
okay? And divide that by three, and you're gonna get 93 millimeters of mercury. Another way you could do it is um, determine your pulse pressure. So if you know your pulse pressure, that was just this diastolic minus, or systolic minus diastolic, right? Divide that by three and then add another diastolic pressure onto it. That's the other way of determining mean or true pressure. Just depends on you, which one you like to do better, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so again, so um, mean arterial, mean, excuse me, mean, mean arterial pressure, 83 is about average. Um, it shouldn't go less than 60. If it's less than 60, 60 millimeters, millimeters of mercury, then that's not enough to really sustain your organs, right? So again, normal 93 is about the average, anywhere between 70 and 110 is considered normal. Okay, so if it falls below um, 60 for any length of time, then the organ at the kind of the ends of your body, they won't get enough blood flow and we say they become ischemic. Okay, so we're gonna come back to mean arterial pressure a little bit later in the lecture, probably in part two lecture. And um, we're gonna, we're gonna um, see how this applies to making sure we have the proper blood flow. But for now, I should be able to give you um, any, any um, blood pressure. Let me stop, share this, and let's put our um, whiteboard back on. Okay, so I can give you any blood pressure, let's say 115 over 75, and have you figure out, um, have you figure out mean arterial pressure, okay? And since you guys, when you guys are at, at, uh, in a classroom, I don't let you use uh, calculators, but you're gonna be at home. And so I'm not gonna be able to stop you, <laughs> but you should be, this is actually simple math. You should be able to do that. So um, basically we have two times 75, right, plus 115. So we're gonna take two times 75, that's about 150 plus 115, and that's gonna be 265. And we're gonna divide 265 by three. And our map, this is map, is 88.3. And that's still within our range. What did I say the range was? 70 to 110. So this person has a healthy MAP. They're still gonna be able to get blood to their organs, okay? Um, so be able to, to do that equation. And uh, I think then you'll, you'll be sitting pretty for um, a test in this material. Alrighty, um, I'm gonna end it there for this lecture, part one. And for part two, I'll pick up at arterials. So again, I'm trying to shorten your lectures so that um, uh, they don't go too long and they make sense. They're gonna uh, just be regarding a certain subject matter. So the next one then we'll get into arterials. If I can stop the video, I don't seem to be able to stop recording. <laughs> there we go. Now I can stop. <laughs>